We've had 5G on our phones for years now, but it doesn't seem to be much better than 4G. So what happened with 5G? It was overhyped is what it was. First of all, by the carriers, they wanted Congress to turn the frequencies that the TV stations are using over to them. So they promised them, if you give us those frequencies, when we bring up this new 5G technology, we'll give everyone gigabit internet and we'll have self-driving cars and remote wireless surgery and all this crazy stuff. But of course, that's not what happened. They got all the extra bandwidth and then they just jammed even more people onto those frequencies, even more phones. And to whatever extent they delivered better internet, people just used their phones even more, using up more bandwidth. So in the end, the actual bandwidth per device, even though the technology is better, we're getting about the same speeds most places as we did with LTE. So can 5G actually give you gigabit internet, or is that a lot? The technology can. If they set aside enough bandwidth, both frequency in the air to get to the tower and on the internet connection from the tower, there's no reason you can't go gigabit with 5G if it's set up to do so. But today, it's mostly not. So the 5G standard supports running on different channel widths. And generally, the wider the channel, measured in megahertz, the faster it can go. It's very flexible. So most carriers are running on 10 megahertz wide channels. But there's this weird option. If you run way up at 7, 8, 12 gigahertz, you have an option to actually run with a 500 megahertz wide channel. This is ultra wide band. And when you're that wide, you can go really fast. This is how you get speeds north of a gigabit. And this is what Verizon 5G ultra wide band is. It is super fast, but it doesn't make it through walls. It really is a line of sight technology. You have to be outside and your phone has to be able to see the tower to take advantage of this. You also have to be closer, right? Yeah. The range is short. It doesn't get through much. So that's part of where it really got overhyped. They were announcing some of those speeds that you could hit with ultra wideband when you were within sight of the tower without saying that, well, it won't work in your house. They really didn't make that clear. And that's where it passes from hype into overhyped. So when would ultra wideband be useful? Well, beyond the obvious, well, if you're standing right next to the tower, I see at least two cases where it's super useful. One, home 5G internet, fixed wireless access. If you can put the antenna outside your house, pointed at the tower, it's worth a little setup. You can hit these speeds. You can get hundreds of megahertz to the tower, giving you potentially north of a gigabit of wireless. And that's pretty cool. The other spot I think about all the time is stadiums. So you can have tens of thousands of people with their iPhones all sitting in neat rows so that if you put antennas on the front of the balconies, they literally can see every phone in the stadium. So now with ultra wideband going to the high frequencies, you can actually give high speed internet to you know, 50,000 people who are shoulder to shoulder. So would that really make stadium internet totally reliable? Totally? No. You still have so many people shoulder to shoulder and you never know who's doing what. This is where, well, I mean, we went to the Phillies game, mm. you and I, mm. and your phone's on T-Mobile and mine's on at and And so we ended up using Speedify pair and chair. And so we were each able to use each other's cellular. And at that point, we were actually able to live stream the game back to people in the office. And neither one could do that alone. Wireless stuff just isn't that reliable. They work better together. So the promises were made based on a frequency band running just 5G. But in practice, most carriers in most places are running in what they call NSA mode, non-standalone, which means they're running 5G and 4G on the same frequency, switching the tower between being a 5G tower and a 4G tower, depending on which phone it's talking to. And that really slows things down. And so this is where you end out with speeds that look remarkably like 4G because you're sharing the channel with these 4G devices. And so the 5G just can't do all the crazy stuff it does to max out the efficiency and use of the channel. Why are they using NSA mode if it's worse? Well, it lets them jam more devices on, right? They need to keep supporting all these 4G devices that are out there. And I guess they don't feel like they have enough bands to just switch over to 5G completely. They're waiting for more phones to get retired. More people to switch to the 5G phones and then they'll start turning them over to 5G only just in time for 6G to arrive and they'll go to an NSA between 5G and 6G right. which probably will stop us from getting the speeds we're being promised for 6G. So when are we getting 6G? They seem to be right on schedule. Their goal is final spec 2028. The network's going live in 2030 and the new
new premium phones going on sale in 2031. So this exactly matches up with what they did with 4G and with 3G before that. They're on this 10-year cycle, and they're methodically marching along it. So what can we expect from 6G? Well, they're not sure yet. There are all these proposals out there, and they're arguing about them, working on them, and some will be accepted, some will be rejected. In fact, there's a story that some of the carriers would prefer that this only be a software update, so they don't need to buy any new equipment. But that seems like it would be a pretty big waste. So there's all sorts of stuff out there about using a lot more antennas, much smarter MIMO, more antennas on the tower to shape the beams and hit higher speeds, and sometimes even have two towers cooperate together to get even higher speeds. So some neat stuff in that area. There's all the usual promises of higher speeds and lower battery and lower latency, and just another round of general improvement. There's a bunch of interesting proposals around edge computing. Sounds like they're thinking about putting some servers in the cell phone tower where application makers can rent some computing so that some of your server software is less than five milliseconds away from everyone's phones because it's actually in the tower. So do you think people are actually going to adopt edge computing? So I don't think that individual app makers, for the most part, unless they're the scale of, you know, meta, are going to want to go through the work of doing a deal with Verizon, a deal with AT&T, a deal with Orange, with EE, go Mm. country by country doing deals with all of them to get their software on their towers just doesn't sound realistic. But there are these CDN companies who operate worldwide and you sign up with them and they cache some of your content much closer to the users. And some of them now have workers. Cloudflare has their web workers where you give them some JavaScript to run on the server and they make sure it runs on whichever one of Cloudflare servers is closest to the user. Actually move around your server code to get it close to the users. So for them, it makes sense to do deals with these guys because they already have customers who are paying them to get the code as close to the users as possible. So they say, we get it all the way out to the towers now. That's a real competitive advantage for them versus Akame and their other competitors. So I think those guys will fight to take advantage of these APIs. And if you use them, they'll move some of your code all the way down into the tower. So do you see Speedify taking advantage of edge computing? So the issue with Speedify is that we're combining all of your internet connections together for higher speed. And we do want our servers as close to you as possible so that they have the lowest latency. But if we put it all the way in, say, Verizon cell phone towers, your Verizon phone can connect to it zero latency that seems awesome but then your wi-fi might be going out some other carrier it might be going out comcast it might be at&t you might have an ethernet to a starlink and now if we're running all of our server software on the tower closest to you then perhaps your starlink traffic has to go through starlink out to the internet all the way to your cell phone tower to get combined together. That's going to add a lot of latency. That's going to end up adding a lot of latency. So it turns out I don't think we want to. I think we just want to be in the big data centers, in the places where all these carriers connect together, those hubs of the internet. That's where we want to be. Not as big an advantage as you'd expect for us to be all the way out on the tower. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe for more connectivity tech discussions like this one.